These are the songs of my people Songs I've heard so long Rhythms and rhymes and harmony They tell me who I am I hear the songs of my people I hear them everywhere Those rhythms and rhymes and those harmonies They give me identity My full name is Lydia Achengabura. It felt cool to be called Achengabura. Miriam Makeba. You don't hear Lucy Miriam Makeba. <laughs> so I politely set aside the Lydia uh, for music purposes. And every time I hear anybody Say, hey, Lydia, I know that's a friend. Yeah, that's somebody who knows me. I was brought up in a large family, uh, comparatively, in Nyanza, uh, where people can have 37 children. <laughs> um, we were my mother, my father, and eight children. Five girls, three boys. I was the fifth. We lived a... Uh, well, let me just say that my parents worked for the government. They worked hard. They were a great inspiration to us had we followed them. <laughs> and with the court cases you're seeing around, you know they are not, we are not the only ones. The eldest, and I named them because I think it will, it will help moving down the line. The eldest, Joanne, the second born, Karen, third born, Jack, fourth born, Lynette, fifth born, Lydia Achieng Abura, <laughs> sixth born, Kennedy, and our last born, Janet. We grew up in the Rift Valley, so I have another name, Chebet. <laughs> and my younger, my late younger sister officialized hers as Jepto. We grew up in Eldred and then started farming um, on the border between the Kalenjin and the Luo. Our family was very, very popular with them because my mother worked in social work, my father worked in the cooperative development, and we did a lot for both sides. And there's one thing that they taught us, you must work hard. When our friends would get, you know, they'd buy the latest CNN and videos. Those were luxuries my parents didn't permit us. We were to wake up 
when we're not in school and go look after the cows, help plant, manage the farm. We worked. And I loved every minute of it. Our farm was a beautiful farm of about 1,500 acres. They used to call it Withering Heights. It was really beautiful. We were a close-knit family. If if you know a family that decides that, oh, okay, tonight uh, we're, we're, we're just going to have a little bit of roast and um, we're going to dance, just the family, we're, we were close. And that's the time when things change. There is a difference between change and reform. Are we in agreement? I'm going to try that again. There is a difference. <laughs> Things changed. When I was 16 years old, my brother, Lamek, and the youngest in our family died in a horrific accident. I had always known my parents to be strong. I had always known my mom, nothing could bring her down. And I saw her completely destroyed. And I found God in that moment. And I became strong for her. I'd read the Bible to her. I started feeling the power above and beyond being happy. Someone called it euphoria. I disagree. Happiness is just happiness. It's not euphoria. Euphoria is what you get after a bit of brandy. <laughs> Well, I traveled to America after college, came back and went to India hoping to set up our own factory. And that was my mother's dream. And when I was in India doing sugar technology, she wrote me a difficult letter and said, Mama, You will finish your sugar technology, but we are not building the factory. I have a heart disease. I continued ahead and did very well. It's a pre-PhD program, and after that I was offered a PhD program, and I just wondered to myself, how much sugar can you learn? <laughs> Yeah. Really. I mean, once it's become crystalline, let's, let, let's move on. Yeah. And so when I came back, I joined the sugar factory to be closer to her, to help look after her because um, my sisters were married, um, we had lost two members of the family, and so it was my brother Jack and Ken and I looking after my mother. And she refused to be looked after, so we were looking after, looking after my mother. <laughs> it was at that time that after having had a very... Um, I don't know how to describe a bad relationship with a man. What did, what's that called? <laughs> I 
I, I, I give it a simple title, it's crap, yeah? <laughs> but then, it's those things that hurt you the most that change you. And when I got close to a friend, I decided, you know what? I want a child. So, I'm a single parent by choice. Of course, I felt the choice was very correct because when I was pregnant, if I swam, I threw up. <laughs> so, you know, something up there was saying, correct decision. <laughs> yeah. And so, Life continued. My elder brother got married. Um, but this darkness kept following the family. And I can tell you something. As people, as you lose people in a family, a close-knit family starts to splinter. True? I remember uh, my late brother, Lamech, I would have called him the speaker of the house. He didn't know how to disagree with anybody. Okay. So we started breaking apart. Three years after my, my mom died. Oh, and I've got to add on to this. You know, taking a decision to be a single mother was really also benched on the fact that mommy is there, you know. But five months later, she passed, when he was five months old. I was daddy's little girl. Yeah, he was strong. He, he could make me a little girl. <laughs> my, my father was quiet, no nonsense, gentle. Um, he, he taught me the other side of caring, caring between human beings, not just the personal caring, not just the community caring. You, you know, there's a difference, yes? Well, if you don't, let me explain to you this. <laughs> um, in Kenya, there are so many families where um, the man of the house or the woman of the house who's empowered is building schools. But if you walk into their homes, it's a nightmare. That he taught me not just, but to love myself, love others, and my mother taught me the great thing to give to the community. So we were left on our own. What happens? The family kept breaking apart, true? because we've, we've lost another speaker. The business started going down, and things started becoming difficult. Debts started to rise. And because when you can't sit together and work out, Believe me, as a family, if you sit together strong, you can work out anything, true? But if everybody has got their own idea and is implementing it, it can be quite chaotic. We finally decided on three members of the family to be administrators. My sister Karen, the second born, my elder brother Jack, 
who took the lead, and Ken. Not very long after that, in 2002, Karen passed. Karen had taken the role of my mother, always worried. How are you and Prince? How is this thing called music that you're doing? Does it even pay? Why don't you do the sciences that you studied? But I'm here for you. Whilst the rest of the family were like, you choose a bad path, stick on it alone. Okay. Two years after Karen passed, my immediate follower, Ken, passed. And you can't express how difficult it is when you start summing up. We were 10, we are now how many? And then I started supporting my elder brother. I was not married. In Luo culture, you, you're a man. <laughs> it's actually the truth. If you're not married, you belong to the home, and um, no operation has been done, you're just a man. So I, I joined my brother to rescue what we had. In 2007, he passed. We remained three of us out of ten. But now the grand, you know, nieces and nephews had come on board as well. That's, that's the, the, the line of pain. I thought, until two years ago, my first nephew passed. You do not become cold inside when you've seen so much, but it reflects in the things you do. And I remember John Obongo John once asked me a Qing, why do you write such sad songs? And I was like, huh? I'm just writing what I feel. And he told me, you feel sadness. And that's when that term change, not reform, change came into play. You can decide that the things that are thrown your way overwhelm you, or you can fight back. You can fight back and make a difference. And so on my journey fighting back, quarters are coming in, I'm traveling all over the world in strange conditions sometimes, you know. Um, but I saw the world, I saw a lot of things. Um, my son finished um, Form 4 at um, St. Mary's and was to go to IB. So he was born with sickle cell. So we had had quite a journey. Quite a journey. And I thought, no, let's see a doctor. Or another doctor. And the doctor told me quietly, your son has a heart condition. He has five months to live. My son is alive today, five years later. I refused to allow the painful things 
that have happened to my life pull me down. And what made me even so grateful to God was that the heart condition, they have a solution now. One of my aunties got me in touch with a, a research foundation uh, dealing a lot with sickle cell. And they are now ready. They feel he's ready to have a heart transplant and that he will survive and that the heart disease is what was really pushing the sickle cell. I was very happy about a month ago when Ministry of Health made me one of their sickle cell um, champions or ambassadors. Not all my life has been full of drudgery. <laughs> but I can say that my childhood was fantastic, my parents made it fantastic. And this is the time for change. This is the time to soar. We have fallen enough. And this is the time that I have sat down, replanned, the Grammy is in there, by the way. <laughs> replanned, and we are going to make it. When Pope Francis came to Kenya, he said an important thing that many people um, missed. He said, in Kenya, we have lost our sense of humanity. Does anyone get me on that? We have lost our sense of humanity and embraced self. If you can put all the money for yourself, even if you, you know, have to reach the equator to fill your money, yeah, that's what we have become. Such that when 90% of Kenyans are living in such poor dignity, in such terrible conditions, it is all right to keep on packing. And I believe it is time for change. But I'm not going to wait for you, 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 and you to change. I'm going to be part of that change. Unless we come together and allow Kenyans to live as with basic dignity. I mean, we have flying toilets. What the heck are you talking about? And then you build a big... No. Kenya belongs to everybody. And so through the difficulties that one sees, it is time that we said through the pain, through the suffering, crisscrossed by the gluttony and all the other madness, the tribalism, we are one country, and if you can wake up tomorrow and make a difference, even knock your neighbor's door and say, hey, how are you doing? the beginning. And that's the change for me. And I will be part of that change. So that is my story that I hope you leave here saying, oh, don't get me wrong, having money is a good thing. <laughs> don't feel guilty about having money. Feel guilty about ha getting it the wrong way but also feel guilty that you don't care enough that even your extended family 
cannot live with a bit of dignity. It's time for a mindset change. I'll sing you a song to close. It's a song that came off the first Afro Jazz album that I did uh, that was nominated for the Core Award. The title is Maisha. Um, yeah, that's the title. <laughs> but, but truly thank you for listening and I hope you take something back that through pain, through sorrow, through suffering, through darkness, there is a light. Majaribu ya dunia Huwa tatizo Kila siku Tua iona mengi Wala haishi Uzuni mwingi Moyoni Mawazo mengi Mawazo, it's a shower.